good to see you if you're here for the first time. Uh, it's really good that you're here. You've picked a great week to come. We're in the middle of our All You Need Is Love series. And last week, Rod was looking at how to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and strength. And today, we're going to be looking at how to love our neighbor. So why don't I pray for us, and then we can dive into God's word together. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you're a God who speaks to us. We thank you that you're a God who loves to communicate to us how much you love us. And Lord, I pray that you'll send your Holy Spirit on us now. I pray that you'll take my words and make them your words. And I pray that you'll take all of our hearts, Lord, and make them like your heart. Come, Holy Spirit, and do a miracle in us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so last, basically last week we looked at how to love God and this week we're looking at loving your neighbor and Jesus says there that the two great commandments are love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself and he says in verse 40, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Everything in the Old Testament hangs on these two commandments. So Jesus must think that these two commandments are really important. Jesus must think that these two commandments are really central to being a disciple. He must think that they're really important things that we need to learn. And being a disciple is being a learner. And that's why we've produced this blue booklet, which is basically a resource that goes alongside this series for us to use in small groups, for us to use in one-to-ones, for us to explore questions about how to love God better, how to love our neighbor better, how to love ourselves better, and how to love each other better. And so we're all learners, and especially we're learners when it comes to loving our neighbors. We're all learners when it comes to how to love our neighbors better. And here at SPS... It's really easy to find lots of examples of people loving their neighbors well. So there's the food bank that we've been collecting for this morning. There's a, a, a great big box out there which is overflowing with food that people have very generously given. There's the night shelter that Sarah was talking about earlier. There's the dad's football, the debt advice, the mums and tums, the alpha courses. There's tons of stuff, tons of very practical, real, concrete ways that people are loving their neighbors here at SPS. And we want to see more of that. We want to see more people loving their neighbors. We want to see more people loving their neighbors even better. That's why we've produced this blue booklet, so we can continue to learn together how to love our neighbors. Because loving our neighbors is actually great fun. Sarah was telling us how, you know, how good it is, how, how, how much fun it is um, helping out at the night shelter. We want more people to be swept up in that. And this blue booklet, that we're, this resource that we've produced is to ask, help us to ask the question, how can we be better lovers? How can we be better lovers? And you need to know that scripture says that God reckons that everyone here can be an amazing lover. Everyone here can be an amazing lover. Just turn to your neighbor and say, you can be an amazing lover. There you are. And that's what following Jesus is all about. It's being an amazing lover. That's what following Jesus has been about for me. It's been about learning what love is. It's been about, been about learning how to love. It's been making mistakes and seeing God get to work on my heart so that I can love people better. And Jesus says, love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. And as soon as he says that word love, we come up against a little bit of a problem in our culture because our culture is deeply confused about what love is. Our culture is deeply uh, suspicious about what love is. The language of love is, is just everywhere in our culture. It's in all of our films, it's in all of our TV shows, it's in all of our novels. Uh, when we do psychology and philosophy, they're all going on about love all the time. But as you start to explore what people are talking about, when you start to explore what people are saying in our culture when they say the word love, you don't have to press very hard to realize that when our culture says love, people usually mean something very different from what Jesus means when he says love. 
you start to realize that our culture's view of love is very different from Jesus' view of love. So I've got some quotes here just to illustrate that a little bit. Rachel Hunter says that love is just chemistry. Al Goldstein says that love is a deception and a trap. Tori Spelling says love is pure and true and love knows no gender. Linda Barry says love is an exploding cigar we willingly smoke. And Leona Lewis says love is a very powerful emotion. And on a more sort of philosophical note, the, the philosopher Nietzsche says love is a state in which one sees things most decidedly as they are not. And Jean Baudrillard, a very influential philosopher, says to love someone is to isolate him from the world. It's to circle around the other like a dead star and absorb him into a black light. He was having a bad day. And Andrea Dworkin, a radical feminist commentator, says for women, love is always self-sacrifice, the sacrifice of identity, the sacrifice of will, the sacrifice of bodily integrity in order to fulfill and redeem the masculinity of her lover. Thomas Saz. The psychologist says we often speak of love when really we should be talking about the drive to dominate or to master. And Matt Groening, the screenwriter, says love is a snowmobile racing across the tundra and then suddenly it flips over, pinning you underneath. At night, the ice weasels come. <laughs> Our culture is very confused about love. Our culture is very confused about love, but you can see what some of the themes are in that, that love is a powerful emotion, that it's a strong urge. Our culture finds it hard to speak about love without referring to sexual relationships. And of course, the Bible talks about love all the time outside of sexual relationships. And our culture finds it hard to speak about love as well without cynicism or suspicion. And so when we listen to those cultural voices talking about love, uh, we hear two things really. We hear, first of all, either something that's painfully saccharine and idealistic, or we hear something which is relentlessly cynical and suspicious. And so that's our culture's view of love, either hopelessly idealistic or relentlessly cynical. And when we start to follow Jesus... When we start to take our first steps as disciples of Jesus, that's probably where we start from. That's probably where we start from. We're probably starting from a place which is hopelessly idealistic. We think that love is going to be uh, really easy. We think we're going to, you know, just swam through this love thing. We're going to walk around in a rose-tinted glow and just ooze love out over everyone and they're all going to love it. Or we're relentlessly cynical. You know, we just think it's just not possible. It's just too much. We just can't do this. You know, maybe loving someone just means leaving them alone, basically, anyway. And that, we, we can manage that just about. And we need to get free of those views. We need to leave behind our idealism that love is going to be easy. And we need to leave behind our cynicism that love is impossible. We need to get free from both of those views before we can go anywhere with Jesus. Because unless we get free, we can't even begin to start to love in the way that the Bible describes. Until we get free, we can't even begin to love our neighbor in the way that Jesus tells us to. And the good news is that God is in the business of setting people free. God is in the business of setting people free. When Jesus says, love your neighbor, he's actually quoting Leviticus you might want to turn there now. It's Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. It's on page 116 in your church Bibles. Leviticus is the third book of the Bible. Uh, and the first five books in the Bible are written by Moses. They tell a continuous story. And at this point in the story, the people of Israel have been set free from Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and all of his gods. They've been set free from slavery. They've been rescued by God. And here they are standing there in the desert and they've been set free because our God is a God who wants to set people free. Our God is a God who wants to set people free. God has set me free. He set me free from organizing my social life around nightclubs and bars and superficial relationships. He set me free from continually looking for comfort, for a comfortable home, a comfortable job, comfortable friendships, comfortable holidays. He set me free from all that and gave me something much, much better. And he wants to set all of us free because that's what God does. He's in the business of setting people free. And only when the people of God have been set free, only when they're standing there on the sand, having been set free from Pharaoh and his armies, having been set free from 
Pharaoh and his false gods, and behind Pharaoh, that great tyrant Satan who loves to see people slaves, only when people have been set free, only then does God give them this commandment. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, love your neighbor as yourself, I am the Lord. Love your neighbor as yourself, you know who I am, you know who's telling you this, it's the God who just set you free. It's the God who just brought you out of slavery. I am the Lord. So we can see that loving your neighbor is not the place to start. Loving your neighbor isn't a rule to follow out of a misplaced sense of duty. Loving your neighbor isn't a moral guide to help you tidy up your life. Loving our neighbor is all about freedom. Loving our neighbor is all about freedom. It's the way to stay free. It's the way to live free. In fact, I'd say that loving our neighbor is the measure of how free we are. How much love can we give away? How much love can we give away? Practical, real, solid love. Love that you can point at and show people about. How many people can we invite into our homes to share our food? How how many people can we bless with our excess clothes and our excess furniture and our excess gadgets that we can give away because we're free and we're not tied to them? How many people can be blessed with the money that we can give to the mission of the church? How many people can we invite to Alpha to share the freedom that we enjoy so much? Loving our neighbor is the measure of how free we are. How much love can we give away? And God is perfectly free. And God loves the most. And God gives away the most love. C.S. Lewis says, God who needs nothing loves into existence holy superfluous creatures. That's us holy superfluous creatures in order that he may love them and perfect them. God who needs nothing loves into existence us in order that he may love us and make us perfect. So how do we get to be this free? How do we get that freedom? If we go back to that passage in Matthew We can see that Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he knows who the Pharisees are that are interrogating him. He knows that they love rules, uh, that they love that kind of moral tidiness that religious people uh, tend to like. And so he asks them a question. And when Jesus asks you a question, you know it's not for his benefit, it's for your benefit. When Jesus asks you a question, you're probably going to learn something and it might be a little bit painful. Um, So Jesus asks them a question. He asks, whose son is the Messiah? Verse 42. And they say, the son of David which is the right answer. And Jesus says, if the Messiah is the son of David, then why does David in Psalm 110, why does David call the Messiah Lord? Why does David call the Messiah Lord? And what you need to know is that in that culture, a younger person always deferred to an older person. A younger person always deferred to an older person, never the other way around. So why does David, why does that great king of Israel with all of his power and all of his authority and all of his honor at stake, why does he, referring to his son, call him my Lord? Why does he do that? And I think Jesus knows the answer, obviously. I think the Pharisees probably know the answer, but they don't want to say it. And it's because the Messiah is the son of David. And if you carry on reading Psalm 110, you'll see that the Messiah is also the Son of God. And Jesus gives them this story because only if we become like this can we start to love our neighbor. Only if we become like Jesus can we love our neighbor. That means not just being born of our earthly parents, but being born again as sons of God. Only then can we love our neighbor. Only if our humanity is joined to the power of the Holy Spirit can we love our neighbor. Only if we invite the Holy Spirit into our human lives can we love our neighbor. This is the order in the Old Testament. It's the order in the New Testament. Throughout the Bible, God sets his people free. He shows them how to worship. And then he gives them this commandment and puts them to work to love their neighbor. And it's the same for us. It's not a rule to follow. 
It's not the place where we start. It's an invitation into freedom so that we can stay free and live free and press into the freedom that God wants us to have with him. So what does this look like? Well, I'm going to end by just giving you an example from my life. And this isn't because it says anything about me, but it says something about God who can even do something in in someone like me. So most of you probably know that for for most of my adult life, I loved motorbikes. And when we planted this church, I had an amazing motorbike. It was an amazing motorbike. It was a Suzuki Bandit 650. It was customized. It was bored out. It had twin hand lamps. Uh, I customized the sprockets and the pegs and the nuts. And if you don't know what any of those are, it doesn't matter. There was an illegally small um, uh, plate, number plate on the back an illegally large rear tire. It was an amazing street fighter. That's what they're called. It was a street fighter. Fantastic. It was a fantastic bike. And a couple of years after coming to Shadwell, I felt like God was telling me to get rid of this bike. And to be completely honest, I thought, yeah, I can do that because I can always buy another one. (laughs) So, you know, I was sort of half there. I thought, I can get rid of that. I can do that. And the first thing I noticed was that I had more time But time that I'd spent hacking around the streets with my mates became time to spend with other people. It became time to help out with local sports for young people in the park down the road there. Time to pray with people. Time to build better relationships with my family. And I noticed very quickly that I had more money. That I could be more generous in giving because running a motorbike costs money. I could be more free in giving stuff away. I could help out people who were stuck financially in church and in my neighborhood. I could take my neighbor's kids to football when they couldn't afford it. And I had more headspace as well. I wasn't thinking about, you know, how to customize a bike and what things to buy to put on it and and where to go on it. And so instead, I could think about what were the needs of the local people around me. I had the headspace to get involved with growth, the night shelter, and with the playground across the road there. I had more time, I had more money, I had more headspace, and more of my identity was in Jesus, because actually a big bit of my identity has been in that motorbike. And once it was set aside, then I could focus on my identity as a servant of God, as a son of God. And as a direct result of that, I took a step back from my career, and I took up a job at an organization called City Gateway, helping young people to get into work, building up that organization over five years. And it wasn't because my motorbike was a bad thing. It wasn't. Motorbikes are great things. After the resurrection, I'm going looking for the motorbikes. But I needed to be free (laughs) from the relationship that I had with it. I needed to be set free so that I could love my neighbors more. I needed to be set free to invite other people into the freedom that I was enjoying, that all of us here this morning are enjoying. I needed to be set free to show people what a life of freedom looked like, what a life looked like outside of slavery. I needed to be set free to enjoy the exciting adventure of loving my neighbor with the people of God in this place. And I think that's what God's inviting us into this morning. He wants to invite us into that place of freedom where we can love our neighbor more. Shall we stand together? Just going to pray for us and then hand over to Rick. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul says, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Lord, we thank you that you're a God of freedom. And Lord, we pray that whatever is holding us back, whatever fears, whatever concerns, whatever things, whatever people, whatever forces, Lord, I pray for all of us this morning that we would be set free to love our neighbors so that we can be salt and light in this place, so that we can love people in real practical ways that they can point to and say, look at those Christians and look at their love.
And Lord, we ask all of this for your mighty name's sake.